Let me get some of the questions that we already collected. Um, some are new, some are... Okay, so, um, well, let's start with Dr. Rizai, since you... Uh, oh, ooh, there is plenty here. I'm gonna try to go through them. We have, you know, 45 minutes. <laughs> So uh, let's start from the GI standpoint. So there's a question, say, does scleroderma weaken the sphincter muscles causing leakage at different levels of the gut? Mm -hmm. uh, is that common with scleroderma? Yes, it is. Um, yeah, unfortunately, literally from mouth all the way to anus, uh, scleroderma can affect it. Uh, the, it can affect specifically the sphincters as well, including the uh, lower esophageal sphincter, and that's the uh, sphincter that sits between the esophagus and the uh, stomach, and that weakens and that increases the amount of acid reflux. That's one of the uh, reasons patients with uh, escleroma have higher risk of um, uh, reflux. Also, it can affect the anal sphincter. Um, anal sphincter actually is very complex. It has two sections, uh, internal sphincter and external sphincter. Internal sphincter we have no control over. Uh, it's usually in a, a tonic position, meaning that it's in contraction. But then when we have a stool in our rectum, that relaxes, right? But then the external sphincter is the one that we have control over. Both of them can be uh, weakened in the setting of uh, scleroderma, and that increases the chance of fecal incontinence. So, uh, yes, to be specific, uh, yes, the sphincters can be affected. Now, the good news is that um, there are treatments for it, right? So, for, for example, for reflux, we have very strong uh, treatments in terms of anti-acids, for example, which are the, uh, the th three big classes of prescription, if you want to talk about it, the uh, uh, medications such as Pepsid, uh, which are the histamine blockers. And then we have PPIs, which is proton pump inhibitors. Those are the very classic ones that are some of them are over the counter. And now, starting February, there is a new class of anti-acids, which are called PCAPs. The first one is approved in the U.S. It's called Vanoprazan, uh, and these have been around for about 15 years uh, in Japan and Korea. Now they just cracked into a uh, U.S. market, and uh, they're even stronger than PPIs. Uh, so, so we have good uh, sort of medications, and then on top of it, obviously there are uh, endo endoscopic and also surgical interventions, which, to be honest. We try to avoid them uh, if we can fix problems with uh, just uh, uh, the medications. Then when it comes switching sphincters, uh, when we go uh, to anal sphincter, there's also good treatments. We have biofeedback therapy, which is essentially a uh, motility nurse uh, helping and teaching you how to contract anal sphincter. Essentially, you're going to the gym for anal sphincter, and that, that helps with the pelvic floor and anal sphincter. That helps. Uh, we have injections uh, that uh, box the sphincter. Interesting enough, these injections are very similar to uh, fillers for the lips. Uh, so this is essentially box the sphincter to help to contain the stool. And now we, uh, we also have sacral nerve stimulators. These are essentially pacemakers for anal sphincter that are placed in, uh, in, in the back. Uh, they have a battery and continuously contract the anal sphincter and helps with fecal incontinence uh, up to 60% uh, efficacy, which is this, um, the strongest data that we have. So to summarize, yes, it affects the sphincters. And two, we do have uh, treatments to help with a lot of patients. Thank you. Uh, so a question for Dr. Zaman, actually two questions. I think they are clustered together. So. Have you heard of Oxygen Boost, now sold on Amazon? And what do you think about taking oxygen periodically for increased energy? Uh, which is actually an interesting question. You, know, you, you may not need oxygen based on criteria, but what do you think about taking it? And then on the same kind of uh, area, do Apple Watches um, do Accurate. a good job with oxygen measurement? And uh, what oximeter is the best? So the, the two things together. Sure. Um, so the first question about this like hit of oxygen that you can buy, if you go to ski towns, you see them as well. So oxygen only works while you're using it. 
So you can get that boost for the time that you take the boost of oxygen, but if your oxygen levels are low beyond that time, it's no longer helping you. So limited to no utility in patients with lung disease or pulmonary hypertension because the need for oxygen is consistent and dependent on activity. Um, people tell me, you know, sometimes that they measure their oxygen level at home. They're like, yeah, I go down to like 76% when I climb a flight of stairs, but I recover really quickly. And so everyone will recover quickly when they rest, some faster than others. Um, but the point is we don't want your oxygen levels at 76% and we don't want you to take oxygen reactively we want you to use oxygen so that it never goes down to 76%. So when we know that you know, reliably with a certain level of activity, maybe that activity is just walking to the next room. If your oxygen is consistently dipping below 89%, it's in the low 80s, we don't want that. We want to prevent that. So think of oxygen as something we want to use preventatively when oxygen levels we know are going to be low rather than something reactive. So sometimes we'll pay, patients will tell me like, oh, I'll put my oxygen on after my oxygen level has dropped, and that's not what we want. So that applies to that boost oxygen um, that you can buy. Um, when it comes to pulse oximeters, uh, there isn't one that I can recommend, unfortunately. Um, and when it comes to the Apple Watch, really don't know. Um, we haven't seen like any validation studies, um, particularly in patients who do have lung conditions, right? So we, um, how good are they at monitoring, um, <clears throat> excuse me, correlating to clinical grade pulse oximetry? We just don't know. Um, something you, one could do is to try to correlate it, right? Because the iPhone gives you like, or the on your phone, you can check what the levels are and try to correlate it with something that is more clinical. So if you're doing a six minute walk test in your doctor's office and you're wearing your iWatch or uh, your Apple Watch, you can see how those values correlated. Thank you. Well, I can say, you know, I have an Apple Watch and I, I, I like to track my heartbeat and so you can even do an EKG, but it really depends how it sits on the wrist. So I think it's, tricky, you know, you have sensors there, even for the oxygen. I, I bet that depending on how you, how tight it is, where you put it on the wrist may have variation. So I think a recommendation that, you know, it's okay as a ballpark or but always validate, always try to get more objective ways, you know, so you don't get misleading, misleading Definitely. information. You know. My husband has a really fancy watch that he uses for exercise monitoring. He does not have a lung disease and it always tells him his oxygen levels are like, wild numbers that are not compatible with life. So um, that speaks to the potential inaccuracy. Yeah. Okay, so question for me, uh, just to clarification regarding the difference between the stem cell transplant therapy versus the CAR T cell therapy. And also there was a question how to get, if you can, if you're not a patient here, whether you can get into this trial. So first of all, the difference. So the stem cell therapy, again, it has the word stem cell that always excites people, but in reality, uh, it's, a, it's a very well-established approach that's been used for, for decades in, in leukemia, lymphoma, and cancer therapy. What it is, the stem cell therapy is basically using very aggressive uh, immunosuppressive drug, particularly cyclophosphamide, like quantities that are really chemotherapy level, they wipe out the bone marrow and main of the old immune system, and then you use the stem cells to regenerate the bone marrow so you get your, your, your red cells, your white cells back and, 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 and go back to normal. So it's not, nothing, the stem cells meaning is just to help getting the bone marrow back on track. It's not that they regenerate tissues or do anything fancy. And uh, you know, the bottom line, the, the, the principle there was if we use the most aggressive possible chemotherapy, are we really able to wipe out the bad cells? And, and as I show in my presentation, you know, well, you pay a price, it's very toxic, and we are seeing the disease coming back, so the answer is no, you don't reset the clock of autoimmunity. CAR T cell therapy, I to, as I show you, they are instead, is a different concept. You don't use aggressive immunosuppression, it's more laser tag to specific cells that you are trying to eliminate, uh, but using your own weapons. So instead of using exogenous substances, you basically engineer your cells 
to do the job, you still have to use some immunosuppression to make sure these cells, once you re-inject them, they are accepted and, and they do their job. But it's way much, much less than what the conventional stem cell therapy does. That's why I'm saying it's safer. It doesn't mean that there's no drugs, but it's way less and it's only one time uh, that, that the conventional you know, stem cell therapy protocols. Uh, so far, there's been published you know, more than and 30 patients with lupus, and then we have also scleroderma patients. The signals is that that is well tolerated and there are no major side effects. So I think we are encouraged by the fact that this is a much less toxic treatment. It's a new concept where you don't, you know, use chemicals or use your own cells to try to, to target the disease, and you have the possibility of engineering. So that we are, now we are using this kind of targeting the B cells, but in the future you can conceive if we identify new bad actors, then you can engineer the cells, goes after those in a, almost like off the shelf. You, you, you know, you have these unique cells that we want to eliminate. We can construct a weapon to go just after those, not the innocent bystanders. So this is a big difference. In terms of trials, there are multiple sites. Uh, so certainly if, you know, we need to do an assessment, be sure the patient uh, has scleroderma first and second that, that meet the criteria. So there is some visits and screening, but absolutely, uh, there is no, you don't have to be a patient at Cedar sinai to, to be part of this trial. And uh, I know that up Northern California has, uh, at Stanford they have it set it up and, and multiple centers are now trying to get it up and running. Uh, but we will be very happy, again, I think at Cedars it will be probably operational starting from January. Uh, if you have interest, uh, and I know there is a lot of requests about contact information, I should have put a slides with all the information, but with, uh, with Tina, we, we try to make sure everybody can have all the numbers to call for, for both in terms of getting clinical appointments or, or to get to be part of the trials. Um, now, uh, the question that I think goes in, inform all of us, uh, which is interesting, you know, say, what can I do about extreme fatigue? Is insomnia a symptoms? Uh, you know, is, is, is there, you know, what, what drives these symptoms? And I think, you know, we, we touch upon our talks, how fatigue, insomnia, anxiety, have an underpinning that goes on all these organs. I don't know if, from your venture point, when the patient comes to you and say, you know, I'm so tired, I'm so fatigued, I can't sleep, I can't function, Brain fog, big, big, big complaint. What, what do you do? What do you recommend? Yeah, you know, these symptoms can be seen in many different <coughs> conditions. Like the triggers for insomnia can be different in one person versus another. So getting more information is helpful. If someone is fatigued, is it just because they're not sleeping well through the night? So if, I'll say from a pulmonologist perspective, some things we do could be a sleep study to see if patients are having poor sleep quality and that's why they're fatigued throughout the day. Insomnia and fatigue, those are two common symptoms of depression. So screening for depression and you know, um, directing patients to the right resources to manage their depression, that might be another intervention. Um, insomnia, fatigue, those could be manifestations of thyroid, um, uh, dysregulated thyroid, so we may check those hormones to make sure that's not playing a role. So it's not like a one-size-fits-all, like if someone has fatigue or insomnia, that's the input, this is the output. It takes a little bit more history and investigation to try to figure out what could be driving it in that particular patient. I can comment on that too. Uh, yes, so the problem with insomnia and fatigue is that how non-specific they are and how many different diseases in terms of uh, different organs can cause it, right? So that's, that's the issue. But when it comes to GI, uh, if you want to give a, a prime example of insomnia in, our, in GI, is there is a disease called hepatic encephalopathy, which is when your liver is not working, right? Uh, and this is in the setting of cirrhosis, for example, right? So the uh, toxins that are produced in the, uh, uh, in the bowel are not cleared or detoxified by the liver. Uh, so the first sign of that, in fact, actually is a reversal of sleep cycle. So people can't sleep at night, 
but they're sleepy during the day, right? So this, uh, so this is very common in the, in, in the setting of hepatic encephalopathy, but obviously this happens only in the setting of uh, advanced liver disease. But the point I'm making is that that's a classic thing that happens for us, right? And what do we do, for example, in that setting? We give them antibiotics. We give them antibiotics, the bacteria that we're producing uh, toxins go down, and then uh, that s uh, sleep cycle reverses, right? So the same uh, concept can happen in the setting of small intestinal bacterial growth uh, with a very uh, more subtle sort of pattern. So that's why, at least from the GI standpoint, that's what we do. We look for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth uh, to see if that's the case. Obviously, uh, that's not one of the causes. That's one of the thousand causes uh, that can happen, and it has to be managed uh, in a multidisciplinary way. Yeah. Well, no, it, it, that was just an example for the liver disease. As you know, so cirrhosis is very obvious. Uh, so you have, you have like liver enzymes that are being checked. They, they just pop up very, very clearly. Yeah, uh, that's just an example. By the way, uh, cirrhosis in the scleroderma is not a common thing. It, it's, it's actually it's quite uncommon. There is only uh, there is yeah, a subset yeah, on, yeah, on yeah. patients with limited disease and centromere that can develop PBC, oh, right? So it's yeah. like a 15%, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so it's not common, but... How yeah. often do you see nutritional deficiency in scleroderma, like a malnourished state, low-protein state that could be contributing to fatigue? Yeah, no, I think this is... A, um, the malnourishment, you know, can have different degrees, but being behind the caloric needs it's a very common re, uh, situation in scleroderma. And they can be due to the medication you're taking. Some of them decrease absorption of nutrients. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and so that's important to factor that in. Or uh, itself, the gut being <coughs> sick, of course, in, in an extreme way. But even when you start to have um, you know, more severe lung disease, as you know, you start to use a lot of calories to keep up the breathing. And, and sometimes people don't realize they're losing weight. Why am I losing weight? And, and, and it's because, either because of the lungs or the circulation, you, you need more energies to, to, to sort of keep it up. So I think it, it's, um, but I appreciate what, on your presentation, you make the point that, that how do you heal yourself if you don't have the nutrients? And so, uh, you know, to, to be able to really uh, do the work to, to, to feel better, to be better, you need to optimize the nutrition. And I think it's, uh, it's another area where certainly we don't have standardized testing to say, you know, you can do a questionnaire, you can try to ask, you know, what, what do you eat, how much calorie, how many calories. But I think it's an area where, where I think we, we would, in perspective, having a nutritionist or having somebody that can really, uh, in, a, in, a, in a formal way, assess where a patient is in terms of his or her nutrition would be, I feel is gonna help us a lot, uh, you know, to, to, to intervene and to be effective on the treatment, so, yeah. Um, question about uh, vascular treat, so there are two questions here that can be clustered together. So one was, uh, you know, for, for limited scleroderma patients and anti-centromere, what's the propensity to develop pulmonary hypertension over time? Does it get worse or does it get better? Uh, you know, what, what does it mean, those red dots, the telangiectasias? You know, those not, if the number goes up, what, what does that mean? And then what therapies are available for vascular disease in scleroderma? So first of all, um, I emphasize that, that patients with scleroderma have varying degrees of scar tissue involvement, but almost all of them have some degree of vascular disease. The vascular disease is the common denominator on every patient, a lot or a little, whether it is just Raynaud's or is it more involved, we need to always think about the blood vessel involvement. The telangiectasias is, is certainly a, a witness, uh, tell us that there is vascular disease, and, and, and these are bundles of, 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 of venules and, 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 and vessels that get more prominent, more, more obvious. Um, there is a study that shows that if you start to have them getting bigger and bigger, and an increased number suggests that underlying vascular process is more active and progressive, and, uh, and definitely associated with risk of developing pulmonary hypertension. Um, I think over time, we need, as a patient is stable, as this, the fibrosis, the scar tissue is controlled, still we look very carefully for, for developing uh, pulmonary hypertension. 
That's a long-term consequences in a lot of patients. Doesn't mean that it's untreatable, doesn't mean it is you know, a, a, a terminal problem, but it's a problem that starts to have an impact. And, and as Dr. Zaman was saying, you, know, you start to have overlapping manifestations. They all sum up and, and create a great, greater burden of disease. So definitely it's in our clinic, and also in the pulmonary clinic, there is always a, a very uh, attentive scrutiny about is there pulmonary vascular disease contributing uh, or, or manifesting right to, to the underlying starting situation of the patient. So definitely we, we do that. Uh, fortunately, uh, the area of vascular disease has had very good drugs that came onto the market and there is a new one that has been approved uh, this year called Sotatercept. Uh, they, they, this medication open up the blood vessels, but also have shown to reshape the blood vessels. In other words, it's not only opening them, but they try to heal the lining, to heal the wall of the blood vessels so those stay open and they don't, don't continue to close up. Uh, the key thing there is starting early on. You know, the problem with pulmonary hypertension is that by, because it's silent for a very long time, by the time we diagnose it, it's already very advanced. So that's why both Dr. Zaman and I are always proactive. If we, we ask the question, do we need to refer the patient for the best test, which is the catheterization? When is the right time to do it? And we are trying not to wait too long if we have suspicion that this is happening, because, and you can speak to it, because obviously we do have good medication that we can use, and they tackle different, you know, different ways of, of, of helping healing the blood vessels. They're not perfect, but we made a big, a big stride. I don't know what's your, 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 your opinion on, on vascular therapy, but I think for the pulmonary vascular disease, we do good. We can talk about the radiance uh, later, but yeah. Yeah, um, I think two things that Dr. Boyne said that I'll emphasize is you need to be looking for it. Um, by the time a patient is obviously symptomatic from it, is later than we want to be aware of it. So. Um, if that's not something your physicians are doing, that's something you should ask about. Um, this should be a proactive screening process because our therapies are gonna be more effective when we catch people in the earlier state of disease than in the later state of disease when it comes to pulmonary hypertension. And pulmonary hypertension is a double whammy. Um, the word pulmonary is in it, but really its consequence is affecting the heart and causing heart failure, failure of the right side of the heart. And so we want to you know, um, do everything we can to mitigate the forward prog progress of that process. So question for Dr. Rezai. This is like a, a hot topic. What effect does Ozempic have on gut microbiome as it relates to GI motility and scleroderma? So what do we know about Ozempic and scleroderma? <laughs> Oh, I, I, okay, so about Ozempic and scleroderma, as far as I know, very little we know. Yeah, no, I, I, <laughs> yeah. We, it's not our go-to drug in scleroderma patients, as, as you know, this, we don't want to suppress appetite, right? So that's another issue. And another issue is that, um, just give you a little bit of how Ozempic works. Remember the small bowel that connects to the large bowel, right? So when food travels through this uh, small bowel and reaches the end of the small bowel, that area is called ileum, right? When that area distends, that sends a signal back to the stomach. I was like, okay, stop, I'm full, so don't eat more, right? That's called ileal break because it's literally a break, right? That is mediated by GLP, which is the what uh, 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 Ozempic does, activates that. So essentially G, uh, Ozempic fools you that your small bowel is full and your stomach is now full and your brain is like, oh, stop eating, what are you eating, right? But that slows down the stomach and that slows down the uh, small bowel and even slows down the colon. So that's why nausea, vomiting, and constipation is a big problem with patients with, uh, on Ozempic, and not just Ozempic, all that category of uh, medications, right? So because of all that, in the setting of a scleroderma, that's not what we reach for. Uh, because it can worsen potentially uh, the small intestinal bacterial overgrowth uh, and uh, the dysmotility and also the reflux. So we don't do it. Uh, so, but do we have clear evidence of uh, that uh, what it does and what it doesn't? No, we, yeah. but that is accumulating. Yeah, it's not been formally studied. I can only 
add to what you said that I do have several patients on, on, on this kind of type of new medications, semaglutide, and, and uh, some of them had to stop it because of loss of appetite, weight loss that was important, or nausea and vomiting. Others are being able to tolerate and, and mm. to get the benefit from it. So I think at the moment we're still collecting information mm. and, 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 and sort of experience. To, but I think, as anything, there is no drug that has only positives and no side effects. Mm. You know, everything, you always have a little price tag mm. for mm. anything you do. And, and, and the complexity of scleroderma is such that when you try new medication, you have to really see in you how they impact your disease. And so always discuss with your doctor, try to, to sort of together figure out whether it's the right thing to do or not and, and what impact it has in the overall well-being. Um, now, interesting question here. How does marijuana affect patients? Uh, here, in parentheses, for lung disease, I would say also in terms of GI, you know, there are edibles, uh, there are, you, you name it now, it's a wild market. I, I, you know, actually I collect information about who is using what, and I, I say it's very wise, whether it is THC or CBD. What, what's on your venture point, the experience with, with people that say, oh, can I smoke, can I eat, uh, um, you know, THC, CBD, what, what's, what's your mm -hmm. feedback? Yeah, I'm a pulmonologist, so I think the <laughs> only gas that belongs in your lungs is room air or your supplemental oxygen. So smoking anything out of the question, don't do it, can't condone it. Um, I think there is this um, idea that marijuana is not injurious to the lung the way uh, smoking cigarettes is, but I have seen explants, so lungs that were taken out of patients who needed a transplant, a young person with who smoked exclusively marijuana, black, disgusting, as bad as a tobacco lung. So we don't want to smoke anything. Um, there are patients who find some CBD um, gummies, they've told me anecdotally, really helpful to be able to go to sleep um, or for um, cough even. Um, so generally speaking, I don't tell patients that they can't take them. Um, I don't recommend it necessarily, but if they are taking them, and some patients are taking it under the blessing of their primary care doctor for sleep, for elderly patients, that might be preferable to taking a different class of actual prescription medication. So generally speaking, I don't um, advise patients to stop um, that if it's helping them, the edibles. How about the GI? Yeah, so when it comes to GI, it's actually more controversial, I have to say. It's, uh, some people advocate for it, some people say, no, it's doing bad things. The classic bad thing that happens with marijuana and um, GI is something called hyperemesis syndrome, THC-induced hyperemesis syndrome, that after years of high dose of marijuana, it leads to very severe nausea and vomiting. Uh, that requires actually almost a, a detox uh, to get it out of your, your system. Having said that, that is not a big percentage of marijuana uh, users. Um, so having said that, we don't go out there uh, and recommend uh, marijuana. There's no question that they do have anti-nausea effects, and that's why we have synthetic uh, sort of uh, cannabinoid receptor uh, agonists that we use for uh, nausea treatment. Uh, that's one thing that we, we do, but the actual sort of using gummies and all, uh, we uh, we don't necessarily uh, recommend. Having said that, as Dr. Zaman was saying, some people come and say, that, hey, listen, this helps with my sleep, and if I don't take this, I can't sleep. I was like, okay, at that point, I don't say that, okay, stop it. So if you're having some positive effect with, uh, uh, with a small dose of like gummies, I, I don't necessarily say that you have to stop it. One uh, thing that I, um, I wanted to mention that it's not well established in, in the literature, but we do see it in the clinic, is that uh, gummies can cause significant uh, dry mouth. Uh, so keep that uh, in mind, which especially in the setting of scleroderma, it can be a problem. Uh, a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Can no, I ask I, a follow-up question? Yeah. Is the dry mouth from CBD as well as THC or only THC? So we don't exactly know. I think there is some component, because you know, gummies, are, I don't exactly know what's in it. Uh, my thinking is that there is something anticholinergic in it. 
uh, that that is causing immediate almost uh, mm -hmm. a dry mouth. I don't know the bad physiology. Yeah, and I, yeah. I would only add that in my experience. It's a wild market, meaning that there is not good regulation on what kind of content you have on those products. You know, it's not considered a, you know, a pharmacological level drug. And so the problem is really the, co the, the concentration of the active principle, the compounding fact. It's all you know, not strictly regulated. And so I believe that that's, it's a liability in a sense of you start something and it may not be, always be the same, and then you don't know if you know, the problem you're having is because of, you know, instead of helping, it's causing issues and, and how to, to adjust that. So be, be mindful of that. But I agree that uh, at the low level, if there is some benefit, you know, at, the approach is sure, you know, as long as I don't see major consequences, it's, it's acceptable. I agree with the smoking. There is so much about even the vaping, the smoking, anything that you smoke has it, particularly for somebody that has already some injury on, on their lungs, you have to be extremely careful about it. Um, how about alcohol? So, interesting question. So, impact of alcohol, uh, I, I think it's, you know, alcohol is an old fashioned drug, meaning it does relax, relaxes you, you know, stretch your nerves. And, but what, what do you need to be mindful of using alcohol from your perspective? You will, both of you, if you have any comment, yeah. Well, I guess when it comes to GI, I don't yeah. drink alcohol. Uh, <laughs> but I, <laughs> well, I, <laughs> we're not quantifying yeah, how I much, but in yeah, general, yeah. what do you need to on remember? The stage. I don't know if you can make blanket statements. <laughs> But, but yeah, so it, as, as, as he said, it's a traditional legacy drug. Uh, so a little bit of it, everybody takes it, but uh, not everybody, obviously. But, um, but in excess, obviously, it's harmful for the lungs. It interacts with our medications as well. Uh, so obviously, we recommend um, a very minimal amount of uh, alcohol on our uh, uh, sort of field. In terms of GI motility, actually, uh, the movement of the gut, it doesn't have actually much of an effect. It quickly gets absorbed. So it is, that part is spares, but obviously it has its uh, deleterious effects on the liver and the pancreas. I'm not sure about that. Can it worsen maybe. reflux? Oh, it definitely can worsen uh, yeah, reflux. Slow down the empty of the yeah, stomach. Yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah, 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 yeah. Right, exactly. yeah. Um, from a lung perspective, you know, you have to be drinking a lot of alcohol to then aspirate, like get stuff into your lungs. So not a direct correlation, um, but alcohol does impact sleep, um, it worsens your sleep quality. People think, oh, it makes me fall asleep, but actually you have much worse sleep quality um, with consuming alcohol. So not great from that perspective. Um, and in general, so beyond lungs, there are, the more data that we see, the more we um, are realizing that no amount of alcohol is actually beneficial to your overall health. I think um, when I was growing up, I would hear like red wine, like protective against heart disease, but on the whole, it turns out that no amount of alcohol actually confers greater health benefits than detriments. Um, so there's an interesting question here. Uh, how do you know if your disease has progressed far enough where you need to be involved in a study. So I think it's an important question. We don't want to wait until you're really sick to, to think about participating into a study. There is, you know, part of the talk I didn't give is why should you be on a study? There are many reasons for you to be part of research. Uh, you know, you're helping others. You gain knowledge about the disease. You may have actually possibility to participate into new exciting treatment. Uh, and I think, you know, that we, we start, at least for my patients, if there are opportunities, discussion about studies at different level, any visit. You know, we have the cohort study that we were doing, so building our cohort, our repository, and then there are clinical trials. But uh, it should be a discussion that you have with your doctor at any time. And I think, you know, there are opportunities for early enrollment and, and, and ability to, you know, fortunately now we don't, we're not gonna leave you without no treatment. You know, the new studies also allows background treatment. So it's really an add-on, and I think it will give a great contribution to what we're trying to accomplish and to accelerate. So very good question, and, and, and that's important. Um, in terms of uh, oh, artificial intelligence, are we using it? Uh, how helpful can that be? I think it goes into the new technology, into the fact that now we can collect so many data and we need, I, I use the word supercomputer or other tools 
that can really help you know, uh, analyzing this data. So I think it, I, I don't think we need to articulate to mo more, but I think it definitely is gonna come as a, as a valuable tool for us and we will use it more and more. Uh, I think in all our fields, we, we, are, we, are, we are seeing new application and new exciting way to do it. Um, well, Dr. Rizai, for constipation, is Metamucil okay every day? <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah, Metamucil is, uh, is fine. Well, uh, Metamucil, as, as you know, it's a fiber, and the whole idea is that it brings in water and it makes the uh, uh, stool a little bit juicier so it, it can, can, can get up, right? Uh, the, the only side effect that some people get um, is a bloating, uh, which becomes a problem, right? Because that uh, fiber, uh, also bacteria like it too, right? So they can break it down and produce gas. So if you're getting a significant amount of bloating and distension with Metamucil, even a small amount, that's the time to move on to something else because uh, that's not something that you can really fix. You have to move on and, uh, and try different things. Fortunately, now there are many uh, FDA-approved uh, drugs uh, for constipation, and also there are a lot of uh, over-the-counter and non-fiber therapies that we do have for constipation. So I definitely encourage you, if you're getting side effects from metamucil, just seek help because there are treatments outside of fiber. Excellent. So one more question, then I think you know, we're gonna have a lunch break. Uh, we, I'll be around, also take advantage of them until they are you know, on the floor that you can ask questions personally. But uh, there was a question regarding the bladder involvement and then endometriosis in scleroderma. I think that goes into the, the fact that, it's, again, scleroderma is not just a one-dimensional problem, can affect any organ. And I think when it goes to GYN and urologic challenges, we, we do face them. So I do have some patients, not frequently, uh, um, not, not frequent, uh, fortunately, but they do have similar involvement that the gut have, where the motility slow down. Even the bladder can start to be less effective. And so we have to deal with that, and obviously there are ways to try to help uh, improving the function. Um, but again, uh, what's the, why does that happen? You know, can be the same question. Why does the motility of the gut fail? And there are different hypotheses. Can be, uh, you know, the, the, f the f tiny vessel that goes to the to the organ that fail, and so because of that, then the muscle dies, and the strength and the contraction dies. Can be there is some hypothesis that autoimmunity is involved. That there are some antibodies or some immune effector that da damage those specific pacemaker cells or those who really give the motility. So. I think it's an area that we are really learning more. And, and uh, endometriosis is not associated with scleroderma, but I, a lot of people experience that. And I would add, you know, um, genital urinary problem, you know, sphincter incontinence, mm -hmm. sexual dysfunction. These are all areas that is very important to address because they do have a major impact. And I think uh, uh, either because of dryness, either because of sphincter function, either because of the medication, the side effects, and the depression, either because of the blood vessels that don't, uh, you know, I'm thinking for male patients, erectile dysfunction can be an issue due to blood vessel involvement. So those are all treatable manifestations, but they need to be addressed. And sometimes, you know, a patient may not be comfortable uh, talking about these things with the doctor, but I think they are important because they are part of our lives, and, 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 and definitely there is uh, something we can do. So I would stop here now. Thank you for all the beautiful questions that you asked. We are gonna be around so we can continue our conversation. And uh, Tina, back to you. And thank you to Dr. Rizai and Dr. Zaman for being a wonderful presence. Uh, thank you all very much. Really appreciate all the Q&A that you helped us with today.